Hi, everyone, and welcome to today's State of the Consumer webinar, The Future of Retail is Fidgetal. And for those who don't know me yet, I am Katie Gross, the Chief Customer Officer here at Suzy. Suzy is an end-to-end -end consumer insights platform that combines quant, qual, and high-quality audiences into a single connected research cloud. So I'm going to spend the beginning of today's program taking you through all of the results and lessons learned from a consumer study that we conducted on March the 10th. And after we review the stats, we're going to be joined by two very special guests, Webb Knudsen, CEO and founder of Playper, and James Malucci, Director of Insights at Beam Santori. They both shared some amazing insights during our prep session, so you do not want to miss out on the conversation we're going to have at the end of the hour. So let's jump right into our topic today. We're going to be talking about digital retail, which is something I'll confess I didn't know existed until recently, and I'm now very familiar. And of course, I now keep, of course, seeing articles about how retail is embracing the new kind of digital experience. So what does it mean? Digital is quite literally an amalgamation of the words physical and digital. And we have a great quote from Storefront that really sums this up. Digital retail is the latest buzzword for the strategies and tactics retailers use to engage with their customers. Digital is a portmanteau of physical and digital, and it represents the merging of the physical with the digital. And for today's webinar, we're going to look at this combination of both that physical and digital space. So first, we're going to look at consumer trends and habits around physical retail. And next up, we'll do the same for digital retail. And then finally, we're going to merge those two to answer the question of how brands should be approaching digital retail. All right, let's start with physical retail. So our insight here is that for consumers, physical retail is all about the experience. In fact, a lot of retailers are turning their attention back to physical stores. The example we have on screen shows that companies like Canada Goose and North Face are even saying that physical retail has never been more important. And looking deeper into this example, they went on to say that companies focused so much on digital experiences that the physical retail stores were kind of neglected for a while, but that the in-store experience is now just as important as it ever has been. And it's important to focus on physical stores because people like shopping. 58% of consumers that we polled said that they greatly enjoy shopping in person. And if push came to shove, 62% said they'd only shop in person if given the choice between physical and digital. In fact, people said they prefer shopping in-store across the board in multiple categories. People prefer shopping in person for clothes, shoes, accessories, pet supplies, home decor, personal favorite of mine, home improvement, cosmetics, toiletries, and groceries. In fact, the only category where people prefer online shopping is for consumer electronics, and even that was 50-50. And the top three categories where they most prefer shopping in-store are groceries at 79%, clothing at 75%, and shoes at 71%. Now, keeping in mind these three categories in particular, this preference makes a lot of sense when we look at the top three reasons why people prefer in-person shopping which of course uh, is touching the products, trying them on and leaving the house. This is particularly interesting because the desire to touch and try on the products is nothing new. People have always wanted to be able to try on clothing and shoes or pick the best fruits and vegetables at the grocery store. But what the third point is showing, however, is that people are thinking about shopping as an entertainment activity. And this is interesting to note that we think about phys sorry, physical retail because we're seeing a rise in things like virtual try-ons and similar products, but we're also seeing a resistance to this. People still want to experience in-person shopping in a way that might not be able to be replicated online. And people do just want to get out of their houses and go shopping for a few hours. Really reminds me of the classic 90s movie, Mall Rats, Hanging out in the mall is just fun. So we're all craving 
fun in-person experiences. And this is even more prevalent since COVID, when people were really missing these experiences and really craving these, um, and that kind of very physical element of retail. And this is something that's true across the board for all demographics, but it's especially pertinent to Gen Z. Now, this is interesting threat, as you may um, have seen kind of come up in some of our other recent state of the consumer webinars. We seem to associate online shopping with that younger demographic and in-person shopping to skew a bit older. But it's actually the Gen Z audience that are really craving that real life interaction. They lost so much of their youth to the pandemic that this generation is now less interested in being online and more interested in being in person and having human interaction. And we've included a really great quote on this subject matter from the drum. It's ironic that while we had previously all been craving human interaction during lockdown, many, co many companies are hoping to replace such experiences with a kind of false sense of reality. But it's so important to bear in mind that as we talk about our digital retail future, that we don't want to just start adding technology for technology's sake, and that they should have purpose and intent behind them. But that being said, there are, of course, some downsides to in-person shopping. And the three things that our consumers said about why they didn't like about in-person shopping were three things. It's time consuming. There are too many other people around. I'm in Times Square as we speak, so I hear that. <laughs> and it's not as convenient as online shopping. So to wrap up this section, the high of physical retail is that it's a more enjoyable experience. But the low is that it comes with added time and added hassle. So moving on to our next section, digital retail. And the insight for this section is that for consumers, digital retail is all about ease. So while physical retail is all about the experience, digital retail is there for the efficiency. And it should go without saying that just because consumers prefer shopping in person, that doesn't mean they hate online shopping. And actually 50% of consumers said they greatly enjoy online shopping. And it doesn't look like they're gonna stop anytime soon. As e-commerce continues to grow and grow, so the interesting insight here is that even though physical retail is all about, sorry, digital retail is all about the merging of the physical with the digital, we are seeing that there's clearly room for these two worlds to coexist independently alongside each other, as well as together. And when it comes to online shopping, the top three things that people like about it are that it's convenient, it can save, you can save items into your car and into your wish list, which is a personal favorite hobby of mine. I have about 500 things on my Amazon basket and it's easier to browse product selections. And that kind of ease translates as freedom and flexibility for online shoppers, especially when it comes to browsing. It's so interesting that the second biggest thing that people like about online shopping is that ability to save items into the car or into the wish list. And we believe it's because it offers that freedom. If you're in person and you'd like something, but you're not quite sure you want to buy it, or maybe you need to save up for it, you have to actually make your kind of purchase decision in the moment. Whereas when you're online shopping, it allows you to have that freedom to save it, to think about it, to take some time, and maybe even save up the money for it. So that ease is giving people that sense of freedom, um, which is that kind of really emotional benefit of online shopping. However, of course, there are also downsides to online shopping, which are paying for shipping, not being able to try things or touch things and having to wait for delivery. So essentially, with digital retail, it's easier to browse and find what you want. But once you've found what you want, it's a lot harder to actually get the product and get it into your hands fast. Which, of course, brings us to section three. How should brands be approaching digital retail? Now, there isn't really one size fits all approach here to the practice of digital retail. And despite all of the discourse that we're seeing around this with buzzwords like hybrid and convergence and blending that are making it seem like digital is quite literally the fusing together of these two shopping methods. But actually, brands should really think of digital retail as simply the blending of physical and digital. Because actually, as we have seen from the previous two sections, consumers view, view physical and digital as two distinct ways of shopping 
that satisfy two very different needs. So our first insight here is that physical retail is all about the experience. Digital retail is all about the ease. So therefore, to truly win at digital retail, what brands need to do is focus on addressing the consumer needs and pain points, as opposed to simply just merging these two channels into one. It's not enough just to stick some iPads and some digital kiosks into a physical store and say, hey, we've done some digital retail here, because that's really not what consumers are after. So how can digital retail address those pain points of both the physical and the digital to create its own niche? So if we refresh our memory of physical retail, we can see that it gives you a much more enjoyable experience, but comes with that at a time and hassle. And so the role of digital retail here is that brands can be leveraging digital retail to curate exciting shopping experiences that consumers are going to want to spend that extra time on. And we have a great quote in support of this on screen. Instead of functioning as a real life version of the online store, brick and mortar locations seem to be switching towards offering very unique shopping experiences. So let's get into examples. A great example here is Nike's House of Innovation. They have locations in New York, Paris, and Shanghai. And these stores have loads of digital elements that really enhance the shopping experience and exist to improve and lengthen that shopper experience. There's gamif gamification, there's a kid's zone, a machine learning bra fitting area, um, and more to really make this an exciting in-person experience that has a digital feel to it. And another example comes from Inky List, which is a beauty retailer. Similarly, they, they created this gamified product discovery pop-up. And it's really interesting because they're actually a digital first D2C brand. So while they don't typically have physical stores, once in a while, they create these pop-ups to give people that chance to have a physical experience while still leveraging digital elements like gamification and the ability to scan QR codes to help them find those products. I just saw one recently this morning, actually, in the news from Clinique as well, bringing that digital experience into a physical store to really elevate that experience and elevate that time. So let's quickly refresh our memory on digital retail. So while it's easier to browse and find what you want, it's harder to physically get that product into your hands. So therefore, the role of digital here is to bridge that gap between physical and digital and make that transition from online shopping to in the hands as sim seamless and simple as possible. Because we saw in the section too, a lot of digital consumer pain points were centered around uh, having to pay for that delivery, waiting for items, not being able to try them and so on. So a great example of this is drone delivery, which is really gaining popularity at the moment. And delivery times are now as fast as two minutes of placing the order. We've seen online everything from toothbrushes to lunch orders. And this could be a real game changer for those products that consumers want to browse online and shop around for. But once they're ready for that item, they can really have it in their hands within minutes. It's an incredible use of digital technology and really enhances the digital experience. I would definitely recommend seeking out this dig article because those drones are definitely not those huge, uh, dangerous, swirly uh, objects anymore that technology has really, really advanced. And of course, I'm British, so I have to give a shout out to the UK brand uh, called Superdrug, personal favorite of mine. They now offer a 30 minute click and collect service in all 800 of their stores. And I love this example because it just shows that digital retail doesn't have to be all about high tech. And yes, the drone is a cool example, but it can just be about blending physical and digital experiences you can order, pay online for that convenience, and then pick up the items on the same day within 30 minutes and get in and out of that store super quickly. And one last interesting example of this is Foot Locker. So there have been many headlines recently about their plans to close 400 stores. But if you click into those headlines, what you'll actually see is that their plans are part of a new initiative that's really gonna focus on opening new stores that focus on the community many, many house of play concepts and specialty stores that really appeal to that sneaker community. So in summary, we know that the physical retail is all about the experience and digital retail is all about ease. 
But there's really no one size fits all approach. And to truly win at digital retail, brands need to focus on, on a lot more than addressing consumer needs and pain points, as opposed to just simply merging two channels together. And when we look at the highs and lows of physical retail, we know that it offers a great experience, but it does take more time. So again, what digital retail here to do is to leverage these kinds of digital elements in a physical environment to curate fun and exciting shopping experiences where consumers will want to spend that extra time. I could spend a whole day in that Nike store. And then of course, when we look to digital retail, we know it makes it easier to browse and to take time to find what you really want, but it's harder to actually get that product into hands. So what digital retail can do here is bridge that gap between that physical and digital as much as possible and just make that transition from online to in the hands as seamless and as quick as possible. So this brings us to the discussion portion of today's webinar. So for this, I'm excited to welcome our two very special guest speakers who've been waiting patiently in the background here for me to wrap up. Webb and James, welcome. Hey, good afternoon. Hi. Hello. Hi. Awesome. All right, so let's get ourselves started by getting to know each other a little bit better. So Webb, how about you kick us off? Would love for you to tell the audience a little bit more about yourself, um, your background and your company. I'm not sure if the audience can hear Webb, I'm not sure. Sure. Oh, sorry about that. Can you hear me now? Yes, I can. Awesome. Okay. Hi. Awesome. I'll say that again. Uh, hi, everyone. Happy to be here. My name is Webb. I'm the uh, CEO and co-founder of Playper. We make planet-friendly toys, uh, plastic-free AR-enhanced toys, and I am also a consumer products investor. We mainly invest in food and beverage, supplements, and fitness brands. Awesome. And James, we'd love for you to introduce yourself to the audience. Sure. Hey, good afternoon, everyone. I'm James Malucci. I am a director of insights on our North American insights and analytics team for Beam Suntory. My team mostly does work in the shopper space, and my background has been in uh, CPG, tech, um, retail, all different sides of the business. So uh, super excited to be here today. So thank you. Awesome. All right. So let's get started. What does the word digital mean to each of you? On that, we'll start with you. Yeah. So to me, this fun digital word means that there is a very real expectation from consumers that brands will be engaging them both in the physical and in the digital realms and that we as brands need to appropriately, adequately prepare for both of those. Awesome. And James, this new word digital, what does it mean to you? Sure. As you um, I thought it was the latest fidget spinner. Um, but <laughs> we learned, uh, I think for us, it involves the use of technology to kind of enhance the physical experience and create a more immersive and engaging experience. Um, for our guests, you know, this includes things like grocery shopping, when I think about Instacart or more in our space, you know, Grizzly, things like that. Awesome. So we gave you some examples of digital shopping experiences during the presentation, but what are some of your kind of personal favorite hybrid shopping experiences? Webb, I know you have some great ones. Yeah, well, thank you. Um, we, we do have some uh, brands that are doing a really good job of this. And uh, the example that I immediately think of is, is a brand that we are invested in, uh, a children's toy brand called Love Every. Uh, it's one of the, our proudest investments. And I, I think they just do a phenomenal job of educating their customers about their products on their online channels. Uh, they do some great Instagram lives and emails and social media posts uh, with pediatricians and educators all about uh, speaking to kind of the various stages of early childhood development. And I just think they do a great job of uh, doing that in addition to selling their own products on their website and Amazon and communicating their value proposition there while also reaching their customers through physical stores like Target and uh, and then further engaging them in the digital realm through the uh, app experience they have, which uh, provides additional value uh, to the products and helps parents know how to use the, the product with their children. That's an awesome example. I can see in the chat there is a lot of Love Every fans here. And James, what about yourself? I was going to say you can count me as a Love Every fan as well. My son is on your subscription box program and he loves it. So. Um, you know, for for me and you know, others, I think it's interacting with our brands from Beam Suntory on social. 
Um, you know, we do a lot of work in that space in terms of providing um, cocktail ideas, usage occasions, things like that, that really bring the brands alive for us. Um, you know, during the pandemic, a lot of folks became at home bartenders. So they were always looking for the next cocktail to do. What can I do at home? What can I make at home? And, you know, to talk about a couple of things with the company, right? Our, on the on the rocks uh, portfolio, right? Bar quality cocktails at home. I know we talked about this a little bit, Katie. Mm -hmm. uh, Same thing. <laughs> yeah. Um, but, you know, th things like that bring that to life at home and then give folks an experience to kind of interact with us on social and tell us about it. And a lot of that drives, you know, next flavors and ideas for us as well that come through that space. Um, I think on a personal note, I'll probably date myself quite a bit here. And this may even proceed when people or some of the folks were bored on this call. But um, I started using Priceline for groceries in 1999. Um, and it was an interesting time and they were way ahead of the curve on that, but, uh, you know, shopping digitally for groceries and online and, you know, obviously big instant cart user today, um, has really changed the game for me, um, especially with a little one at home now. Yeah, that's awesome. And I have to, of course, give a shout out, of course, give a shout out. Uh, SVP of customer success, her dog is named after one of your popular brands, Basil Hayden. I did not name my dog Maker's Mark, but I would do if I could. <laughs> um, all right, so brand approaches to uh, digital, legacy brands versus startups. So for consumers, of course, kind of view physical and digital as two distinct shopping experiences right now. So how do you appeal to them at both stages of the shopping journey? And Webb, we'll start with you. Yeah, um, I think that uh, for for us, like uh, as, as former Disney executives, being storytellers is, is very important to us. And so telling that story in a compelling way um, with our uh, paper products is, is a really important piece of that. And, and you tell the story differently in the physical experience versus the digital realm. And so I think, you know, for, for us, it's just kind of all about what is the story that you're telling? What is the message and adapting uh, that to whichever realm you're in, whether that's physical or digital. Awesome. Um, and obviously, as an online first brand for kids, how do you ensure that your target audience is kind of really engaging um, with your products? We, uh, particularly at Playper, we walk a balance between talking to children and talking to the parents uh, and, and uh, the, the toys and all of the marketing material that we put in the, the box kind of speaks directly to the child versus email, social media and, and other things that we do online it speaks to the parent. So we have to be really careful about kind of not upselling the child and uh and but but at the same time trying to educate the parents on the up and coming products that we have coming out yeah it's really important um and what plans do you have to create a kind of more hybrid engagement experience yeah great question um so we founded our company uh playper around the uh hype of pokemon go i'm sure a lot of people on this call remember pokemon go and people walking around with their phones in their hands and uh we really saw, uh, you know, Pokemon Go kind of helped us see the potential of augmented reality technology for the kids market. And so we feel like AR is a really special and interesting technology for kids because it enhances the world around you, uh, but doesn't take you out of reality completely. And so um, we are very conscious of the fact that uh, it can often come across as gimmicky or like a cheap novelty. So we've tried to be really careful to, to not fall into that trap with the way that we use AR in our product. But um, uh, we've tried to integrate it into a way that feels very seamless to the experience. So for example, when you are in the app, you might be asked a question that relates back to the physical product itself. Uh, so you have to go back to the physical uh, toy castle and, and count the number of pickles that are in that jar before you can progress in the app. So I think that's uh, kind of how, how we viewed it a bit. That's awesome. I do remember those Pokemon days. I lived in Brooklyn and I saw many car accidents almost happen. <laughs> so James, on the other hand, you work for a, a, you know, a company with many more legacy kind of brands with a lot of brand recognition. Jim Beam, Megas Mark, Basil Hayden and so on. Um, so what types of kind of purchase patterns have you seen with your customers? Are they more likely to purchase in store via delivery app? And how is that changing over time? Sure. So I'll try to, to give you too long winded of an answer here, but I think it's important that we talk about kind of the different spirit types and where we play with wine and beer in that space. Uh, you know, over the pandemic, beverage alcohol really went through 
digital as purchasing really largely moved online. Um, according to some new research we've seen, right, that change is here to stay. Probably not surprising to anyone, right? That was a huge paradigm shift during the pandemic. And beverage alcohol e-commerce sales are expected to reach, I think last I saw, like $42 billion globally across kind of key markets by 2025. That's a growth of about 66%, I think is what we've heard. Um, a quarter of global drinkers now order online. So kind of as we look forward, we kind of see e-commerce is going to command 6% of all off-trade beverage alcohol volumes by that time. And that's really up from less than 2% in 2018. So that's a huge, huge jump in a very short amount of time. Um, you know, when it comes to e-commerce, wines held a long advantage over other beverage alcohol categories. When we look at them, we talk about kind of direct to consumer. Um, you know, wine represents less than I think 25% of overall off-premise alcohol sales, but it captures like close to over 60% of online sales, which is huge um, for the wine side of the business. Um, you know, and e-commerce represents about 10% of total off-premise wine sales. Um, when you look at that comparatively to kind of beer and spirit much smaller piece of the pie. Beer is like one and a half percent and about 3% for spirits last year. So wine really dominating in that space. And kind of one of the reasons for that dominance is that most, almost all states here in the U.S. allow wine producers to ship direct to customer or DTC, as I mentioned, where far fewer states allow beer um, spirit producers to ship directly to consumers. And that's like less than 15 states permit alcohol retailers or even non-producers to ship directly to consumers. So it's a really interesting space, you know, um, Wine is uniquely kind of well suited when we talk about e-commerce as well. Um, in states that permit direct to consumer wine shipping, you know, online shopping is usually often the most convenient way for those consumers to acquire certain hard to find vintages, things like that, or browse wine from a particular kind of region or winery. Um, so, you know, the U.S. has over 11,000 different wineries alone compared to like 2,300 craft distilleries. So there's a lot for kind of budding kind of source to explore. Um, Plus, on top of that, you know, wine prices, the price of wines really just tend to be just right. Lower price point of beer makes it hard to produce such kind of justify shipping cost. And although the price of spirits is better suited for shipping, you know, the market's smaller and fewer states allow direct shipments. And that's really a challenge for us. Um, so when we talk about, sorry to give you the long history of that. But with who's shopping online, you know, we found two customer distinctions in the online beverage space. Really, you know, the first is a more conventional shopper. They they browse, they look for more traditional e-commerce via websites. Platforms are usually used by older consumers seeking good prices, known brands, and kind of they're prepared to wait for delivery. The other half is really your digitally native, right? Participating in modern app-driven e-commerce preferred by young legal drinking age consumers looking for kind of interesting or premium brands. Um, we talk premiumization a lot in this space and they're willing to pay for rapid delivery. So two thirds of these workers have made their first online adult bev purchase pre-pandemic. So we're continuing to see that grow and grow. And, you know, given the pandemic and overall change in consumer shopping behavior, it's certainly not surprising for us to see alcohol e-commerce is growing very quickly, as I mentioned. I think what's interesting to see is significant variations that kind of have developed across and within markets and how different consumer groups shop via e-commerce and what their priorities are. Um, no doubt that e-commerce has clearly become a grain for many consumers and it's kind of cementing its place in a third sales channel for adult beverage, for sure. Yeah, I know we spoke last week, yeah. I know we spoke premiumization being so key for you. Um, people don't go out as often, so when they do, they definitely want to treat themselves. So how do you approach that kind of in-store experiences, tastings, tours, any examples you have? Sure. Um, you know, our motto at, at Beam Centauri is come as friends, leave as family. Um, so guests who visit our distilleries, they really want to learn more about our brands and some of the, they're some of the most engaged um, customers we've had. Um, visits and shopping at our distilleries really offers a differentiated experience than shopping for our brands at like a liquor store or a bar. And digital engagement offers us a way to stay connected to those most engaged consumers kind of long after they leave our distillery. So, for example, things like our Maker's Mark ambassador program that we offer to consumers, it really helps to spread the word far and wide about their favorite expressions of Maker's Mark. And in return, they not only get their names placed on barrels at our Star Hill Farm, but they also receive um, early access to products, brand news, exclusive event invites, and maybe, you know, we throw in a surprise or two along the way. So, you know, I welcome everyone that's on the phone uh, and on the video here with us today to kind of hop on and become an ambassador. It's free to join. Um, it's a great program. So I'll make a plug for that, for, of course. But 
Um, you know, like I said, we're on a premiumization journey. It's really driven by a unique value creation model that we have at Beam, and that work begins with customer centricity. It really relies on incredible value and quality and superior storytelling. And I know storytelling's been mentioned, but we have such a rich history, right? Um, at Beam, and you know, it ends with executional excellence across consumer touch points. So superior storytelling for us is made possible by our culture here that is really empowering people to kind of unlock the histories of the company's premium brands, um, which are deeply, deeply authentic and personal, right, to consumers for us, and to really feel more powerful global kind of consumer engagement and build the future of being centauri. That is awesome. It's so great to hear that you're kind of so consumer centric. So I would be remiss to ask, how do you use consumer insights to help you kind of inform some of those decisions and those shopper experiences that are being curated? Sure, absolutely. And I think, you know, it all starts with insights for us, you know, from things like product, look and feel, labeling, color, shelf placement, right? When you think about if a bottle's clear and what does that look like versus a bottle that's covered in a label or wrapped, um, how much spacing and holding power do we have at the shelf, point of sale materials and caps displays. I mean, the list goes on and on, but I can tell you we are hyper-focused on the consumer and how we kind of interact with them and us at both the physical and digital shelf. You know, one of the big things for us is really, right, and inside is just data if there isn't a tangible kind of so what a call to action and everything we do and everything we provide. Yep, absolutely. Um, so the digital kind of future, um, I'm, I love saying the word digital now, but I've learned to kind of practice it. So the digital future, one that surprised us in our research was that consumers are still shopping in store simply to have somewhere to go. <laughs> so, and I can, I can feel that. Um, this is a trend, it was in the early days of the pandemic, um, but. Do you think this habit is here to stay? And Webb, we'll start with you. Sure. So um, I, I kind of view this uh, through the lens of, of a parent. Uh, I'm a dad of four young kids. I have a two-year-old, four-year-old, boy-girl twins, and a seven-year-old. And I can say that uh, I can definitely relate to that uh, notion of uh, shopping in store just provides a place to go. And I honestly, I, I love going to the store with my kids. I, I think... Um, you know, I was telling you guys beforehand that uh, we actually just got back from a trip to Disney World for spring break with my kids and my kids loved it. But I honestly think Target is a close second for them. Um, there, there's really nothing like exploring the toy aisle with kids at Target or at Barnes and Noble and seeing what they naturally gravitate to. I, I don't think there's any replacement for that experience. Uh, websites, catalogs, social media is all great. But really, in my mind, there's no substitution for being at a store. Definitely. My favorite places to go as a child were Toys R Us and the Consumer Electronics Store. And definitely today as an adult, Target and Ikea are my Disney. <laughs> um, James, what about yourself? Sure. Um, you know, I think you could literally never leave your house today with all the ways to order online, right? But kind of like, where's the fun in that? Humans are social animals. And for us in adult beverage, right, we're still in a high touch business. Spirits is a social business in itself. So People are looking for, you know, a personalized experience, experts in the business. They're always, you know, like to go out, get recommendations. So for me personally, you know, I enjoy going out to what we call kind of our larger format liquor stores, whether it be a Total Wine or BevMo or ABC Fine Wine and Spirits or Binnie's for my local folks here in Chicago. Um, and really talking with folks in there just to get recos or just talk about what's happening in the business. Um, I do think for a lot of folks here I've talked to, right, our Binnie's is like, you know, Disneyland for, for spirits and liquor, right? You just kind of go out and see what's new out there, or there's tastings on the weekends in there. You get to try a lot of different things. So um, we have lots of consumers across different experience levels, right, in the spirits business. So they like to go out there and they like to touch and feel the product and see what's happening. And um, at the end of the day, really, like what you drink is very personal to a lot of people. And we have lots of fiercely loyal consumers and what they drink, you know, they take that as a definition of who they are. So we want that level of loyalty with consumers and we want to be that brand of choice when they're out shopping. Yeah, it's really, it's really interesting that the brand of alcohol really does tie into someone's personality sometimes. Um, and you're doing dogs after it, right? It's got to mean something to you, so. Exactly. <laughs> um, it's Bottle King in New Jersey and it's an enormous store, so a big fan. <laughs> um, so what would you see as the next wave of digital shopping? And James, we'll start with you. Sure. I mean, for me, I think like I touched on direct to consumer, we really need more markets to open up so we can continue to explore that space. Um, I also think, you know, interesting things happening in NFTs and NFTs can get a bad rap um, at times, but virtual ownership of like rare bottles and rare spirits seems to be a great opportunity for digital ownership, 
by using NFTs to do that and kind of enable that. Interesting. I know when we spoke last week, you also yeah. spoke last week, you were travel opening up to places like Mexico and Japan. Do yeah. you see that as kind of being the next wave of kind of a digital shopping experience? We do. I mean, we welcome everyone to come out to anywhere we distill spirits. You know, like I said, um, there's mm -hmm. plenty here in, in Louisville, but I think outside of that, right, we have distilleries in Mexico. Um, we have things in Japan. If you're ever over there, you know, you're welcome to come to any of our Centauri distilleries and try some of some of my favorites right away, a Japanese whiskey portfolio. Um, so great opportunities to come out and interact with the brands in a, in a kind of different way and really understand the rich history that goes with the brands we have in our portfolio. Yeah, awesome. Um, and Webb, how do you see the kind of the next wave of digital shopping? Yeah, I, I personally, for me, I'd, I'd like to see and think we are already starting to see more experiential retail experiences that really bridge the gap into digital in a really fun way. So uh, just to provide an example, um, I was at the new Toys R Us location around Christmas time in Herald Square, and I thought that they did a great job of creating opportunities to take pictures with all of the Toys R Us characters, Jeffrey the Giraffe and uh, other characters and other really fun things like they had a recreation of the Macy's Day Parade uh, done all in Lego. And so, you know, I think just providing uh, opportunities like that for people to take pictures with those things contributes back to the the kind of digital uh, realm in a really fun, cool way. And I think we're going to see a lot more of that going forward. Yeah, that's awesome. And so can you share any plans on the digital futures of your own products? Where we'll start with you. Yeah, I mean, uh, speaking to augmented reality in particular, I think there's a, a lot of opportunity to uh, utilize AR in, in a very cool way to uh, have people bring the products into their home in, in a way that uh, we haven't been able to do so much in, in the past. Uh, so I, I think there's going to be a lot more use of that um, for uh, companies like, like ours to uh, show what the product will look like in your home and, and actually allow you to experience it and and play with uh, toys and things like that before you actually uh, make a purchase. So that's something we're looking to do more of. And um, we have some other, you know, uh, really interesting kind of hybrid engagement uh, uh, experiences that we're looking to do with our product that engage the uh, user in a really seamless way. And uh, we'll, we'll have some exciting innovations coming out later this year that uh, I hope you guys stay tuned to, to keep track of. Awesome. And James, any kind of future digitalization <laughs> for your products? <laughs> so I would say we're very active in our social channels across our brands, but the digital work for us is really still in the early stages. Um, and obviously, the legalities of marketing spirits is challenging, so we always want to ensure we're sending the right message about you know drinking smart and responsibly. Um, outside of our Beam Centauri business, you know, you see producers like 19 Crimes Wines doing like augmented reality with their labels with. Um, Snoop Dogg and Martha Stewart, which, by the way, is a better combination of two people to be put together. But um, it's exciting to see the marriage of that technology and kind of see where the adult beverage space can go with that as well. That's awesome. And shout out to Martha Stewart. My uh, boyfriend is the camera operator for the Martha Stewart TV show, so he works with her every single day. <laughs> um, all right. Well, we have tons of questions from the audience and um, they've been asking live. So I'm excited to dive into a number of these. So I will try to get to as many of them as I can. So we will start with you, Webb, a question from the audience. We're seeing more regulations around screen time for kids and young adults. So we'd love to hear how you're um, looking at this and is it affecting any of your kind of product planning? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, it's, it's affecting our product planning. I think for us, you know, we've uh, tried to uh, shift our focus uh, back towards more social emotional learning and, and really uh, trying to play a role in the mental health conversations that's going around and uh, with kids. I, I think, you know, there, there's definitely uh, a need to limit screen time, but I think that uh, we, we view ourselves as, as having an obligation to, to really introduce healthier screen time opportunities that don't lock kids into a screen and make them turn into screen zombies. But uh, really, I, I think there's a good way to do screen time. And that's really what we're trying to tackle here is uh, uh, introducing screen time in a way that is interactive and, and not just passive and, and really uh, contributes to the uh, uh, educational benefit of, of children and where, you know, pedagogically aligned with what they are supposed to be being taught at, at those ages. That is awesome. 
Um, and James, kind of staying on the theme of the younger generations, how are you appealing to Gen Z consumers that are now starting to become kind of largely of drinking age, but we've heard from all the stats, they definitely drink a lot less alcohol. Sure. We are certainly, you know, non-alcoholic beverages are certainly top of mind for us. Um, you know, late last year, we released um, a Centauri all-free beer that is kind of zero, triple zero, we'll call it across the board, um, to start addressing that space and a little bit more in a niche kind of space with, you know, Japanese flavor type of beer. Um, we're constantly looking for bringing new things like that to the market, but certainly staying very close on flavors and trends. Um, you know, other examples, we launched uh, Truly Vodka last year at a partnership of Boston Beer, and, you know, to kind of address that what's happening in the ready to drink seltzer space that's just kind of skyrocketed as well but um we certainly try to keep our finger on the pulse of what's happening with taste and trends but also looking for new and interesting ways to interact and social and um anything that kind of goes out from us is really kind of directed at how do we kind of capture that that like you said that legal age drinking that's just kind of hitting the marketplace yeah, that's awesome. There's so much innovation in the kind of low and no alcohol products um, out there. It's exciting to see. Um, okay, here's a question from the audience. So I'm interested to hear your thoughts on the metaverse and how you envision it playing a part in both physical and digital retail experience. I think it's an interesting question given that I think Facebook is putting um, some of their kind of initial investment in metaverse. So who wants to take that question first? Web, I'm going to pick you first. <laughs> The metaverse is it something? Uh, you know, I, I honestly like for the kids market right now. I don't. I don't think that there's much that we are looking to do in the metaverse. I, I you know, th this might be an unpopular opinion, but I kind of think the metaverse has been a little bit overhyped. Um, and uh, for for us uh, with, with our uh, product at Playbird, it's just not something that we have really factored into our product direction at this point in time. So we'll, we'll, we'll keep, we'll keep an eye on it and keep kind of tracking it. But um, I don't, I don't think it's, uh, ha, doesn't have a whole lot of bearing on us right now. Yeah. I think that Mark Zuckerberg probably agrees with you given the uh, shifts they've, they've made recently. James, any kind of metaverse thoughts? No, I would just, you know, agree with what Webb said as well. It's not really an area of interest for us too much at this point in time. Um, not to say it won't be in the future, but I do think it was a lot of hype at the moment and when, you know, we're, we're in the type of industry that's definitely slow moving and, you know, we're not a tech side of the business. So certainly we are kind of catching up on trends as we go and learning, but I don't think it's anything for us at the moment that we are looking to invest in. Yeah, for sure. So this is a great question. Um, do you have any advice for folks in the audience as to how, you know, how do you know that your digital offers are enhancing your product experience instead of being kind of con confusing or having a different mm -hmm. message? Sure. I can start off with that. I think um, everything go for us goes back to our history. So that's really our North Star. So if we're on brand with that and on point with talking about the rich history of our brands and kind of translating that into social in a more modern way, then I think that we're we're doing our job. Um, you know, that's probably easier said than done, but certainly trying to reach the younger, you know, legal drinking age like we just mentioned coming into the space is certainly challenging for us. But um, certainly, you know, we lean into the history of our brands and, you know, brands that have been around for, for hundreds of years, right? So um, as long as we're telling that story and continue to tell that message in a new and exciting way, I think that's the best path forward for us. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, but do you have any advice to make sure that message is kind of on brand, consistent and, and not confusing? Yeah, I think it's just a matter of getting the product into people's hands as much as possible, doing as much product testing, focus group testing. Like you never know how your product is actually going to be used until people actually start playing with it and experiencing it for themselves. We, When we were launching our company, we gave away our product to 350 people or families. And, and the way that they experienced our product was different than how we had imagined it. And so I think for us, it's just a matter of kind of getting it out there and then seeing what people do with it. It's a great point too, just to add on for us too, we do spend a lot of time talking to bartenders really to understand how our product's being used in that space because typically, you know, pre-pandemic, right, you know, on-trade really drove the, the trends that you would start to see in off-trade or in off-premise. Um, and that's that's getting back there again. And certainly, so we're trying to stay, you know, as much on the tip of the spear as we can with folks, but really talking to bartenders and understanding how consumers are consuming our product. It's just a great feedback loop for us to have as well. Yeah, that's great. My brother manages a bar in London and I'm always fascinated to hear kind of what the latest trends are. 
um, Fanta and vodka seems to be the latest thing in London, as well as flavoured gins. Yes, that's it. Yes. <laughs> um, so another question we have here is, oh, um, which staple items do you think people are going to always purchase in stores? Mm. I could probably start. For me, I can a Red Bull on the way to the train station every morning. I will always buy that in store. I don't want a mass delivery. I like my little ritual. Go to the store, get on the train. <laughs> so for me, it's a can of Red Bull. I was going to say things that are more ritualistic to me, right? Grabbing a coffee in the morning or things that you want for immediate consumption um, are probably grab and go type things, convenience. Um, we're seeing a ton of growth in the convenience channel, um, especially in adult beverage. Um, and we've just seen convenience grow, I think, overall, right, through the pandemic. And they're you know, trying to play that place um, kind of a, as a destination as well. So I think grab and go, kind of immediate consumption. Um, I'm still in the clothing camp as well. Still like to kind of try and touch and feel, right, the hand of fabric, as they kind of call it, as you kind of walk around a store. And um, I know there's so many options to order and send things back, but the hassle of that seems a little bit as a difficult entry point. Um, I do use kind of try on before you buy an Amazon for a lot of things for my son, mm -hmm. but still, you still have to make a trip to go back or find a way to get that product back if you don't use it. So um, I'd rather just go and know and not have to deal with the hassle of doing a return. Yeah, somebody in our audience yeah. actually mentioned uh, custom clothing um, and being able to be measured. I would recommend to that person to check out that Nike store we mentioned earlier because they do do a kind of virtual bra fitting for sports bras. Um, and I've seen definitely some other examples um, of that. I'm trying to remember the, name of the brand where they can kind of do a digital measurement um, to help order clothes online. What, what are your thoughts? Yeah, I, I, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, yeah I was just going to say, I, I agree with James. I think that uh, for me personally, uh, clothes have been something that I've had a challenge with getting right uh trying to shop online that often ends up not to be the right size or not the right fit or fill or whatever so uh for for me personally that that's something that i i tend to prefer to shop uh in person for and then this is kind of ironic considering amazon started with books but um i love to shop for books in person i love going to the bookstore especially for kids books um sorry that so much of my conversation goes back to uh kids here but uh i love browsing kids books uh ch children's books are so much fun just to uh, flip through in person so i'm a big fan of barnes and noble and uh places like that where you can uh shop for books in person yeah it comes back to that experience where they have the coffee shop and the soft chairs and the smell it's like the smell of books that you also kind of yeah. can miss and that also sure. awesome all right, well, that about wraps up all of the questions from the audience. So I want to thank both James and Webb for doing an amazing job. We could have chatted for hours, um, I'm sure. And for anybody in the audience, please feel free to uh, reach out to us here um, at Suzy to ask any more questions about digital um, or all things online research. All right, folks, have a fantastic rest of the day. Thank you. Thanks. Okay, bye.